Thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Just so you know, today's session will be recorded. And since this is a webinar, you are all automatically muted, um, just like I was. Uh, please feel free to join. <laughs> please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name, gender pronouns, job title, and where you work. Uh, we will give folks another minute to join before we get started. Thank you. All right, again, as you're coming in, uh, welcome. We're glad to, to have you here. Uh, you're all automatically muted for this webinar, uh, but please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat with your name, gender pronouns, job title, uh, where you work, and also share if, um, what, uh, where you're calling us, calling in from. And if you know in the chat, there are uh, contact information um, regarding if you need any tech support. So um, let's, we can move forward. So next slide. Uh, since this is a webinar, you will not have the option to turn on your camera or unmute. However, if you would like to participate, please use the functions at the bottom of the Zoom screen, um, as you see here, the icons. For informal conversational contributions, please use, use a chat box. And for questions for our panelists or regarding content, please use a Q&A box. If you would like closed captions, please click the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen and select show subtitle. <clears throat> We put the call-in information in the chat box, and if you have any tech support needs, please send a chat to panelists or Tessa Tech Support, or you can send an email to tpulaski at farmworkerjustice.org. It's um, in, in the chat. And also uh, Tessa uh, um, included her phone number there too, in case that will help um, with uh, contacting her. And one final note that we will be sharing slides, recording and speaker information after the webinar. Next slide. Uh, one slide before this, please. Thank you. <laughs> if you have not already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat with your name, gender pronouns, job title, where you work, uh, where you're calling us from. Please remember to select all panelists and attendees before sharing. Uh, my name is John Minyap, and I'm the Associate Director of Health Equity for the Association of Asian Pacific Community Health Organizations, or APCHO. Um, APCHO was formed to create a national voice to advocate for the unique and diverse health needs of Asian, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities and the community health providers that serve their needs. Uh, we are joined today by our partner for this event, Alexis Skilled, the Director of Health Policy and Programs at Farmworker Justice. Farmworker Justice is a nonprofit organization that seeks to empower migrant and seasonal farm workers to improve their living and working, working conditions, immigration status, health, occupational safety, and access to justice. Um, and next slide, please. And I will have um, Alexis share our uh, agenda today. Thank you, John. And we're so excited to have all of you joining us today. So we just wanted to give a quick overview of what this webinar will uh, look like today. So we're going to start off with some interactive polls just to find out more about where you're calling from uh, and the languages of the patients that you serve. 
Um, we then will have a great panel from three health centers who will share the work that they've been doing around language access. And then there'll be time at the end for Q and A, um, and then we'll finish up with some resources. And of course, we ask all of you to fill out the evaluation at the end. Next slide, please. So uh, we are going to use Mentimeter in order to uh, just learn a little bit more about where you are calling from. So on your screen, you'll see uh, menti.com. So please type in menti.com and then the code uh, you see there on the screen is uh, 6083-2073. So um, once you go into menti.com and type in your code, uh, you will see the map. So um, please, um, for this first question, um, please just drop a pin on where you're calling from and, um, and then you can click back into Zoom to watch the results. It looks like we have a number of people from California, Michigan, New York, and it looks like Virginia. Looks like we have some good representation in the Southeast and the West Coast, Oregon and Washington. Hawaii, welcome to our Hawaii folks. Looks like a good representation from the East Coast as well in the upper Midwest. And we'll give people another few seconds to, um, to pin in where you're from. Um, so thank you everyone for sharing that. It looks like we have really great representation across the country and we look forward to hearing from you your questions and the work that you've been doing to provide services to patients. Um, our next question, if you want to go to back to menti.com, the next question is um, the languages that your patients speak at your health center. Since this is focused on language access, we wanna learn from you and hear a little bit more about what languages your patients speak and how, so we can talk more about, you know, how we serve those patients. So this will be a word cloud. So please type into Menti the languages. So English, Spanish, Haitian, Creole, Cantonese. Looks like there's uh, many of you serve Spanish speaking patients. Chuch, which is an indigenous language as is Mixteco. Cape Verdean Creole, Marshallese, Korean, a lot of languages. We'll just give people a few more Burmese, someone typed in to the chat, Laotian. Fantastic. So it looks like a lot of you serve patients in a lot of different languages. Um, certainly Spanish, uh, Vietnamese, Haitian, Creole, and English seem to be the most popular, but uh, Korean, Tagalog, uh, Haitian, Creole, Mandarin also seem to be um, languages that are spoken by many of your patients as well as many other languages. So um, thank you so much for participating uh, and you can now exit out of Mentimeter and come back into Zoom. Next slide, please. So um, I just wanted to quickly go over the learning objectives of the webinar today. So the first is to recognize the unique language access needs from the perspective of limited English proficients serving community health centers. And we have three great representatives who will share the work that they're doing with limited English proficient patients. We also want to identify resources to address language access needs, um, especially because many of these needs have been increased um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And then of course, uh, we hope that you'll be able to apply promising practices to expand language access through partnerships and support for bilingual and bicultural staff. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to John to give you a brief overview of the background for this webinar. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, so this fall, APCHO and Farm Market Justice hosted listening sessions for community health center staff to share challenges, promising practices, and innovations in language access amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to discuss the highlights from the listening sessions and hear from three individual health centers about promising practices they can share with the broader health center community. 
we, we don't have the time to de delve into all of the lessons learned in the listening sessions, but here are some of the key challenges and growth areas that we shared, that were shared. Misinformation and mixed messaging about COVID-19, lack of in-language alerts and offsite services, gaps in coverage for different dialects, and interpreter burnout. Honestly note that Farm Worker Justice will be publishing more detailed information from the listening sessions, and we will talk more about that later. Uh, next slide. Um, all right. In addition to challenges and growth areas, community health centers shared some of their key successes and promising practices such as mobile outreach service, evening hours, bilingual, bicultural staff, in addition to CHWs, community health workers, um, partnerships with smaller pharmacies and investment in visual and oral materials. Uh, next slide. And lastly, here are some of the key recommendations from community health centers during the listening sessions. We will use this list to inform future training opportunities uh, in language listening sessions, team building trainings for frontline workers, region specific innovations and assistance, standardized training for interpreters and onboarding trainings for other health center staff. So with that, we have covered objective one, identify unique language access needs in limited English, English proficiency serving health centers. Next, the panelists will discuss some of key challenges, promising practices and innovations from the individual health centers in more detail. So next slide. All right, Alexis. Yes, um, so thanks, John. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's panelists. Um, we have three great panelists. Um, we have um, Alnori Gutlai, from the, uh, who is the Vice President of Health and um, at the, for Prevention as, at the Center for Pan-Asian Community Services in Georgia. Lulu Tumajan, who is the Outreach Specialist and Community Health Worker Lead at Hope Clinic in Texas. And Mary Zelazny, who is the Chief Executive Officer at Finger Lakes Community Health Center in New York. And so um, as we go through the panel, I will be asking a few questions initially of our panelists. And then uh, we certainly encourage you to type in any questions. Um, also, uh, I know uh, Mentimeter happened very quickly. So if there's anything you'd like to share in terms of um, languages that your health center serves or where you're calling from, and you did not have a chance to do so in Mentimeter, we encourage you to please share that in the chat as well. Um, and please um, include any questions for the panelists in the chat as well or in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to kick off this discussion with just a few questions. Um, and just a reminder that we will be sharing the slides at the end. So um, we certainly hope that um, you come up with some good questions, but I am going to kick us off so I'm gonna ask all of our panelists just to start off. Um, as health centers, you of course strive to provide in-language support and interpretation for your patients. But you know, there are many challenges, of course, in serving patients in language. So um, can you just share some of the challenges your patients face, especially outside of your health center? And anyone can kick us off. So, Mary, do you want to go first? Please do. So, uh, thanks. Thanks, Alexis. Um, you know, our patients, so we serve, we're up in upstate New York, rural. Uh, we have a very large farm worker population uh, here, predominantly Spanish, Haitian Creole. And, you know, when they come to our health center, health centers, you know, we have pretty good systems in place to help them with language services so that they can get what they need, you know, staff, we hire from the communities we serve, we have uh, certification programs for interpretation, all that stuff. The problem is when we send them off to a specialist or to some public health or to food banks, wherever they need to go, most times what we found is it's a real challenge for them because there is not the same level of language access for them. And so what we find is that uh, we have to continually bring our patients to wherever they need to go. 
And as a community health center program, as we grow and get more patients, we just, it, the, the ability to keep handling more and more patients is so challenging because other providers, specialists have said, you know, if you don't bring an interpreter with this patient, don't send the patient. And so how do you answer that question, right? What do you do with your patient? You can't just leave them hanging. So it's, it's very challenging for people once they get out of that community health center circle of care. Thank you, Mary, for sharing that. Um, Lulu, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Sure. Um, so uh, I'm in Texas, but specifically Houston, and Houston is the third largest hub for refugee resettlement in the United States and has been for several years now. Um, and so HOPE works with several nonprofits um, that specialize in resettlement of those. So my answers to this question are going to be informed by what our partners and stakeholders in the refugee resettlement sector have uh, emphasized to me in many of our webinars and our meetings. So of those no small nonprofits, we've worked with Firestarter, which is a nonprofit that connects um, other nonprofits and community members who are doing related work. We work with um, Boat People SOS, which supports primarily Vietnamese immigrants. And finally, we work very closely with Houston, uh, Houston Welcomes Refugees, which function as supplemental caseworkers, and they provide welcome kits, welcome teams, and move-in teams for incoming refugees and parolees. We also work with uh, all organizations in the Houston Refugee Consortium. So these, a lot of these are national organizations that you might have heard of, the ones that we really work with um, very recently and very strongly are YMCA International Services, Catholic Charities, Interfaith Ministries, and Alliance Multicultural Services. And what we're finding right now, what we're really dealing with, what all of these organizations are burdened with right now is the influx of Afghani refugees. In uh, the end of August of this year, it was estimated that between uh, 1,500 to 2,000 Afghani refugees were going to be resettled over the next six months. Um, and what we're dealing with right now is trying to find housing for these incoming refugees and parolees. They're being put in temporary extended stay housing and Airbnb. Um, the ideal and what has happened in the past when the system hasn't been so burdened is that they're resettled immediately or very quickly to um, apartment complexes in sort of the Southwest Houston area. Um, so when spaces open up, that's where they go to, but there's um, right now incoming refugees and parolees are staying in these temporary houses for months on end without a real answer as to when they will get more permanent housing. Um, the next and the next issue that's been brought up that is more related to our webinar today is um, translation services. Uh, Houston Welcomes Refugees, I mentioned, do, does welcome teams. And part of those welcome teams, uh, what they do is train new refugees and parolees on how to use um, public transport. And so when there is a translation issue, these our new neighbors um, have a harder time learning these basic um, civilian skills. Um, so that really leads into the next issue, which is um, finding English classes and vocational training for this population. Um, one of the in, uh, one of the organizations as part of the Refugee Consortium is the Bilingual English Institute. Um, but the larger issue with this sort of English education is that there's a lack of awareness of other programs that might work better with scheduling. Um, so we've tried to compile a list of other programs um, that can help. One of them is Prestige Learning Institute. And um, the issue with vocational training is sort of how limited the state makes it. Um, Texas Department of State and Health Services uh, only provide vocational training for uh, organizations that are Texas Workforce Solutions certified. Again, this brings up an issue of scheduling. If we believe that if an individual is passionate about a vocational training or certification um, and that program has had a high matriculation in the past, that these new neighbors of ours should be given the option um, of state funding to try out whatever program fits best with their schedule and their child, whether it be their work schedule or their childcare schedule. 
um, that childcare schedule transitions into my next and pretty much final point, which is um, prenatal nutrition education, prenatal care education and resources for expecting mothers. And um, we, any expecting mother that comes to the Hope Clinic that we need to refer out for this sort of education, we work very closely with Texas Women's Infants and Children's. Um, and that nutritional education, you know, for Afghani women coming in um, in their third trimester, that's very important. And the last and final thing I'm going to say is um, that a lot of incoming Afghani women who are not coming from city centers, but rather villages, uh, there's a lot of literacy issues that we're encountering. So while we're trying to survey their health, even though our paperwork is translated into Pasho and Dari, we found that they still needed an interpreter. When we dug deeper, we found that that was because of literacy issues. So we've been pivoting some of our strategies to go back to some more old school sort of small group education and radio public health messaging. Um, so just outside of our health center, those are a few of the things that we've been dealing with. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you, Lulu. Anari, do you have anything you'd like to add to the discussion? Yes, um, so for CPACs located in um, Atlanta, Georgia, we are a multi-service agency um, focused on providing in-language services to the immigrant and refugee communities in the area. Um, so along with FQHC, we are also fortunate enough to have other types of services available for the communities. So with that question, um, other types of major challenges that patients face is barriers in accessing services uh, because of transportation. So Metro Atlanta is not the most accessible when it comes to public transit. So some counties have more, have more bus routes than others and operate separately from each other. So for individuals where English is not their first language or even the language that they speak, understanding how even public transit systems work and how they differ by counties become another layer of barrier they have to overcome. So one of the ways that we've tried to navigate that is by building our own mini tra uh, transit system um, within the area and also providing like transportation um, services. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, Anari, I'm, I'm gonna stick with you for a moment um, and just continue this conversation a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, there are lots of challenges around, of course, language access and making sure that there are materials, um, not only in the languages they speak, but also um, like different formats, kind of thinking about literacy levels. Um, but there also are a lot of mixed messages. Um, and especially in, in the southern part of the country, um, there have been um, different uh, challenges unique to what's been happening um, in the south. Um, can you talk a little bit about how CPACS has addressed and responded to the mixed messages, um, especially given the growing diversity of patients that you serve? Yes, so this is actually an ongoing challenge for CPACs as a whole. Um, but some of the things that we have done is really to ensure that staff are representative of the communities that we serve. So representation is essential and necessary. Um, as an agency, our staff speak over 19 different languages, um, as a clinic, 80% of our patients are either from the immigrant refugee communities. So majority of the staff hired are bilingual. We especially put a lot of emphasis on that with our front desk staff. So we have some who speak at minimum three languages. Um, and we are extremely lucky for that. Like having staff who speak the language is important. Language lines are there, but it requires extra, extra time and steps. Um, Educational materials have also been translated into different languages, and we try to use plain language to capture information. Translating documents is useless if you are using terms that aren't used regularly. Um, I think sometimes we forget because, you know, some English vocabulary words are just like everyday language. Um, but when it gets translated, that's not part of like the common colloquial language that's used. At the same time, as um, we've already mentioned before, like some patients are not literate in their native language. And so therefore translated materials will not serve their purpose. Um, so with that, we have hired patient navigators who are either community leaders or directly from the communities that we serve. They help patients navigate all the different resources being offered at the health center. 
patients will not know what resources or services are available if we do not provide the necessary access to that information. Um, patient navigators build those relationships with the patients. For example, um, I know this was pre-COVID, but sometimes maybe the patient navigator needs to do a house visit where they discuss um, patient health needs. In doing so, they are also able to help the entire family. If the mom is the one coordinating with the patient navigator, maybe since they're already there at the house and since the children will need to come with the mom um, to her appointment, then the kids can also go with her and see their provider or maybe go, you know, go next door to dental. So the patient navigator can then easily schedule transportation service for the entire family and it reduces the burden on the patient. Our patient navigators also act as our educators. They help ensure that scientific and accurate information are given and communicated to the patients. Thank you, Honore. And actually that actually um, fits really well into the next um, uh, question that I had, um, thinking about community representation in the clinics and the role of patient navigators. Uh, Lulu, I know that at Hope Clinic, you have community health advocates. So can you talk a little bit about their role and how they're addressing the language needs of the patient population? Sure, thank you, Alexis, for the question. Um, so we have two teams. We have one team that's our community health workers and a team that's our community health advocates. They really do very similar work. The distinction is that our community health workers are certified by the Department um, of State and Health Services. And our community health advocates are doing similar work, but don't quite have enough hours to be grandfathered into that certification or haven't taken those classes. So what we do is we pair a certified community health worker with a community health advocate who is of the community. And we try and make sure that that community health worker is also of the community. Um, and there's three legs of what they do, of the tripod of what that team does. The first is to educate and outreach into that community in language. The second is to canvas and create partnerships with schools, cultural centers, places of worship, or just community organizations. And the fourth is to identify and strategize culturally competent um, responses to vaccine hesitancy. Um, so they survey the community for health needs, for their overall health and wellness, and for specifically vaccine hesitancy. Um, that way we address language needs from the outreach side. Um, and they translate public health messaging, they translate our town halls, they interpret at our vaccine events, and uh, they translate, um, you know, recently we've worked with the Asian American Pacific Islander Health Forum to do translations about um, COVID and flu vaccinations. Um, it's really wonderful to see these teams of community health work and community health advocate together, especially if they're from different cultures. They can identify a lot of uh, similarities between culture and then use that to um, strategize our outreach per ethnicity. Um, our team at the Hope Clinic, our staff speak um, over 30 languages. We provide services in over 60 languages through a third-party translator. But our community health advocates going out into the community speak a lot of, um, besides just what the ballot is translated in, which is Chinese, Vietnamese, Spanish, and English, our translators speak Amharic, Urdu, Nepalese, Spanish, Pasho, and Dari, Rohingya, and Burmese, and Arabic. Vietnamese and Chinese. Um, so Houston, you know, like I said, it's the third largest hub for refugee resettlement, but there's also no ethnic majority in Houston. So we're serving a melting pot with a melting pot. And um, that's what our, that's what that team does. Um, so thanks for the question. And that's so important. And, um, you know, someone noted, and I do want to note, um, you know, uh, a lot of languages, so I'm thinking Spanish specifically, but a lot of languages, you know, have um, different um, uh, languages within the languages. And so, you know, um, for Spanish, for example, you know, Spanish varies from region to region, um, but also there are many, um, there are many individuals who live in communities where indigenous languages like Mixteco and Mam and Quiche and Zapotec and others are the primary language. 
and Spanish is the second language. And I know that's the same for many other areas around the world and many of the patients that you serve. So I'm sure that um, understanding and having those uh, representatives in your health centers who not only speak that primary language, but also may speak these other languages as well that are spoken by the patient population of that area, having that cultural connection and that mutual understanding is also really vital to provide the services, I would imagine. Definitely, Alexis. And I think the one buzzword that I would add into this conversation is dialects, um, not just in language services, but in dialect services um, are really what we strive for. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to um, change the conversation just a little bit um, and uh, Mary ask you, so thinking about farm workers um, and Lulu mentioned vaccine hesitancy, um, we all know that there have been um, a lot of challenges in getting farm workers specifically, um, getting them vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, and many health centers have partnered with agricultural employers um, in order to reach the farm worker communities. Um, and I know that Finger Lakes has really been building those relationships. So can you talk a little bit more about your work with uh, the agricultural employers um, and how uh, you've worked with them to assist public health um, in in-language contact tracing and case management, um, especially to, for COVID-19 um, with the farm workers and the families that you serve? Sure. Thanks for the question, Alexis. Um, so what we so we serve a large uh, farm worker community up here, and it's pretty spread out. And we have services at all of our health centers for farm workers, in addition to our normal services that we have. However, you know, COVID hit, and a couple things happened. First of all, the farmers shut down their farms and said, I, "We don't want anybody on our farms." And public health was faced with, because of all their cutbacks that they've all had across the country, right? Our public health departments are shrunk compared to what they used to be. So we had a real problem on our hands because we are getting uh, farm workers would be coming up to our region. It was March, right? When COVID hit in 2020 and farm workers are starting to come in. We had crews that were already here and farmers were terrified that someone would come up from maybe another part. He knew he didn't have COVID at the time in his farm uh, worker staff, and then people were coming in. So um, we, we continued. The one thing we did is we increased our staff that goes out to the farms, goes out to housing sites. Uh, we worked with multiple organizations, Migrant Education, Migrant Head Start, Cornell uh, Farm Worker Program. We did webinars for the farmers. We did webinars for the farm workers. And we particularly reached out to public health and said, listen, you know, because we need to be your conduit to speaking to these uh, patients of ours and the, to the farm worker community because what would happen is a, a farm worker would get COVID and then of course the, far, the, the public health department had to go monitor them once a day and make sure that they weren't leaving their quarantined area. Well, if you're a farm worker and you're, you don't really know where you are, you know you're in New York and that's about it. And you know you have COVID and you're not supposed to leave your house. And some lady keeps driving up and parking at the end of your driveway and staring at you for 10 minutes to see if there's any movement. The, you know, we've had a long couple of four years prior to COVID hitting and people were already very nervous up here because we're near an international border. So there was a lot, there was a lot of presence and it just, people were really freaked out. So what we did is we created a system where public health would initially call, if they got a positive COVID case, they would call us first. We had always had a community health worker on call 24 seven so that we could then be either tell the farm worker, listen, you have COVID, this is the stuff you gotta do, that, 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 that. Or we would be on the call with public health if we needed to, or we would go out to the house or the farm with public health. And what's interesting about that is, first of all, it really calmed people down, right? Because it was just crazy. Farm worker, farmers were nervous, farm workers were nervous, and public health didn't know if they should go left or right. And so the dynamic of providing those services to the farmers 
being accessible to farm workers, you know, we told them, we're not going to come in your house. We're not going to go in the barn, but we're going to come. We're coming to the farm and we're going to give you education. We're going to give you masks. We're going to give you whatever you need, food, whatever. But we want you to know we're here and that if you need any help. Um, I think that, you know, reaching out to public health in that way and working with the farm community it has changed our whole relationship. And we've been here a long time, since 1989, providing services, but something happened. And what I kept telling my team is that, listen, we have to be the Red Cross of the region for the farm worker community, because, you know, we can't, don't, no one else goes out with us because everybody wanted to go out. All of a sudden, farm workers were the big buzzword up here. You know, let's serve farm workers. And we we're like, no, you're not coming with us. Um, we, we're here for them. We have to provide them language services, particularly, but other services, because they couldn't just go somewhere and get something because they do, couldn't uh, speak the language or get there. There was all those barriers that we all see every day. But it's really changed that relationship. And it's been a real positive for us because what we've done now is really tried to grow that. Um, we have done massive vaccine clinics out in 22 counties um testing of farm workers all of a sudden all our jamaican farm workers said oh by the way we need to be tested within 72 hours of going home can you do it uh, when are you going home oh tuesday <laughs> so we had to really move it but having those relationships built over the last year had has really been tremendous particularly for the farm workers because um they totally get that we're a trusted source for them and that we're there for them and that public health is, you know, they're not going to turn them in. They're, they're doing, you know, cause trouble for them. They're there to try to get them so that they don't spread COVID and do other things. So it's been, it's been um, interesting silver linings to the COVID pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Mary. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in on the chat as well as in the Q&A, a lot of fantastic comments. Um, before we move to those, I just have one final question for the panelists, um, and this is for all of you. Um, you know, all of you shared about um, your bilingual, bicultural staff, um, whether that's um, community health workers, front desk, uh, providers, and others. Um, but of course, with all of the need, um, there is potential burnout, as everyone has been seeing across the health center system. So um, in what ways are you working to support your bilingual bicultural staff? And Mary, um, I'll uh, have you jump in first. So, you know, one of the things that I struggle with is that I I need my bilingual bicultural staff so much. This pandemic has just demonstrated that they have all done double duty. They've worked extra hours. They've given up their weekends, nights, you name it. So, so we've done a lot of um, heroes pay. We flex their time. If something happens, we've been, particularly through the, the pandemic, because a lot of our um, staff, we hire from the communities we serve, and sometimes they're also the caretaker of their family because maybe they speak English and their native language. So sometimes they get called to do family things that, um, you know, would pull them away from work. And we've really gone out of our way to be super flexible with all of our uh, bilingual bicultural staff because, um, you know, life happens, right? And and we can get by and we've really tried to cross train our staff because I need their, I need to have my, particularly this, my spike bilingual bicultural staff, because they come from the community that they serve, they understand those cultural nuances and all those things that I can't teach them. I can teach them how to use a computer and Excel and a date book or whatever. I can't teach them that. That is such a valuable thing that they bring, resource that they bring to us. So in exchange to that, I have to be really flexible with them and allow them to be able to try to maintain some control in their life in this crazy time and also provide them with security at work and support by their teams. So we do whatever we have to do. 
seems like people are very supportive of that in the chat yes. <laughs> and are very appreciative of that. So that's great that you're providing all that support to your staff. Um, Lulu, uh, is there, would you like to add to the conversation? Sure, Miss Mary, I do wanna say that you wonderfully articulated the importance of being flexible with our bilingual staff. Um, I would just further that to say that we make sure that if there are cultural holidays or family celebrations that they would like to observe, we try and make sure that they, we block off their schedule so that they can. Um, we support their culture by letting them observe their culture. And uh, finally, we make sure to ask um, during evaluations, we begin and focus on how they would change the work that they're doing and how we can help them avoid burnout. If being accountable for a certain project is proving too time consuming, we want to put team members around them so that the burden falls less on them and more on a team. Um, and then we act on the feedback that they give us in these evaluations. Certain team members, for example, have asked for more responsibilities. So we've been able to divert some of their efforts to other projects that take into account their specific interests and their skills to try to make sure that what they're doing is meaningful to making a difference to their community specifically. We want them to see successful outcomes that they have helped us achieve and find fulfillment that way. And uh, finally, we give them the space to canvas and suggest events as a result of all of that work. Uh, we want to demonstrate that we have a trust in their abilities. And then uh, finally, I want to say that my office, our office has a wonderful birthday culture. We um, decorate people's desks according to their interests and we theme everybody's birthday. Um, so that's really fun for us. Uh, we also, of course, have regular staff lunches. Um, we have, you know, quarterly staff lunches. And, um, and then we also do social media highlights like the staff member or bilingual contractor um, of the month. And then they get a small token of our appreciation, whether that's a gift card or a lunch on us. Um, and just, they, they are so essential to our work. Um, we would not be as effective without them. Um, so I think it's very important that we put effort into making sure that we're supporting them. Absolutely. I think recognizing all the efforts um, and all of their work, but also um, I really like what you shared about providing space to be able to observe their culture, their observances, holidays. Um, that is so important. Um, you know, it's really about valuing, you know, everyone's cultural backgrounds um, and observances, um, observances. So that's um, really important. And I think um, that's really great that um, Hope Clinic does that. Honore, how about CPACs? Uh, yes. So the health center and CPACs as a whole rely heavily on our staff who help clients and patients um, navigate services. So through that reliance, we also have to ensure not to overburden the select few because without them, programs or services are that much harder to provide, advertise, or implement. So as what has been um, being repeatedly said, flexibility um, is key. So sometimes we understand that to build relationships with the immigrant and refugee communities, we cannot always dictate when or where or how those should be established on paper. It's, it's just not going to happen that way. Um, so giving staff creative freedom to figure out or suggest different ways of solving issues and supporting those ideas is, is essential. It may not always work, but we learn through experience. Um, another way to lessen the burden, this is more of a systematic way on our bilingual staff is deciding as a clinic what languages will be prioritized on what days. So maybe on Mondays, we will, focusing, we will focus on scheduling Nepali speaking patients and having all those language access needs available for that. On Thursday, it might be Cantonese, Mandarin speaking patients, and they will be prioritized. And in doing so, bilingual staff um, aren't randomly being pulled in um, for services at all times. So it, it, it keeps it a little bit more organized and systematic. I, I know that emergencies aren't planned, um, but it, that is one way we can help alleviate the burden. Thank you so much for um, to Alnuri and for all of you for sharing um, all those great insights um, into how you're supporting your staff. Um, I am going to turn it over to John um, 
to uh, moderate the Q&A from all of you. We have lots and lots of questions. Um, so we should just jump right into it. Yes, thank you, Alexis. Did I also put questions in the chat regarding um, these questions? If you provide training programs for bilingual or bicultural staff, um, and if you do, which programs are they official programs um, or like third party programs, I'm sorry, or, or uh, official internal programs? Uh, so feel free to share your insights there as well. Uh, I'm looking at the questions and there are, uh, there are a lot, but there are also numerous that are focused on CH, or sorry, uh, certification. So there's some questions about um, nationally certified certifica uh, certifications, um, how to get certified for medical interpretation, um, what states require CHW certification, um, and then some other key parts about training, like uh, getting educated about cultural understandings of health, illness, treatment, and then there are comments also about um, cultural differences with language and um, dialects. So uh, do, and then there's also a question about um, bridging the gap. Um, be, uh, if there was, the, there's some um, clarity needed around if that's a training up, uh, training um, program or uh, recruitment or certification. So, um, <laughs> any of you would like to answer anything about certification that might um, be helpful for our uh, attendees? I'll start because I mentioned bridging the gap. So, so what we do with our with our staff is that if you have um, we test people to say, it doesn't matter what language they speak, we test them in their native language we have. If we can't do it, we have someone that is totally fluent, be, be able to, from an outside source, test someone and say, yes, their Spanish is perfect or their Vietnamese is perfect. Um, and so then they're able to take this program through Bridging the Gap. It's a, a 46 hour class that they take. And it's not to teach them language, it's to teach them how to be interpreters. And it really focuses on cultural competency, how to deal with, the patient isn't usually the problem. It's usually the provider that is the problem when you're interpreting um, and saying things that maybe aren't appropriate and how does the interpreter deal with those situations. So, so the training that they get is how do you deal with how do, you, how do you become an interpreter that is fully qualified, understands the ethics, all those things, right? It's not teaching them language. At the end of it, they have to take a test. And if they pass with a certain score, they got a test pass with an 80 or above, then they are certified through bridging the gap and they get a certification. But they also take the, not, the national um, test. And so what we built, we're, and we are actually, actually had a meeting today to fine tune it. We need to figure out levels of interpretation because if you're in with a provider and you're interpreting, you have to have the highest level skill of interpreter um, services, right? But if you then, let's say you're the front desk, well, you don't necessarily need to be certified as a medical interpreter, but you still have to have the language skills because what we're trying to avoid is having people that, and frankly, this happens a lot with providers. Oh yeah, I speak Spanish. And it's like, you know, I don't need an interpreter. It's like, mm, yes, you do, because you can have some really bad things happen. And so how, and we don't want family or, you know, friends interpreting for people or, or crew bosses most particularly, especially like if you have someone if we have a Burmese crew come in and they want, oh, we'll let the crew boss will say, oh, I'll be glad to interpret. No, thank you. That, you know, our policy is you can't interpret. So we've really tried to fine tune um, how we interpret, who interprets and, and what their skill set has to be for the different levels. Um, but it, it really does help our staff because if you're bilingual by culture and you and you feel that you have the language skills and you can pass the test and you go through the course we i always tell people um particularly those folks listen this is great because you're working for us and we're so happy that you've gotten this certification blah 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 however this will follow you for your life this is a real opportunity you for you to have another skill set another something that you can take because this may not be your end job you might move on to something else and this is a really good opportunity for you to learn a skill to be an interpreter because it's only going to get more popular 
as a job because we desperately need these services across the entire country and every every piece of our economy, right? So. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that um, that explanation, and appreciate the, um, the the examples that you shared. Um, also, with uh, keeping um, keeping internally uh, some um, checks with some of your uh, providers, and just reminding them of the, of the expansive need. Um, I'm going to move on to an, a couple of other questions that are somewhat related. I know that they're also very specific, but one question has to do with digital literacy um, impacting community members. How how has digital literacy impacted community members accessing and utilizing healthcare services, especially during COVID-19? And also another question about um, speaking about resources for how to help new neighbors who are uh, limited English proficient and cannot read or write in their source language. Um, maybe Lulu or Alnari can, um, can share some insights on that. Um, I just got uh, my explain to you guys that we work with Firestarter, which is a nonprofit that connects um, nonprofits. And through them, we had a conversation with um, Interfaith Ministries, somebody who works in vocational training at Interfaith Ministries, who emphasized that whenever we discuss language issues, it's incredibly important to also talk about digital literacy and how low that is in incoming communities. But what an important skill it is because it allows people to find, like I said, different programs that are outside of what is prescribed by the state that works with them in their schedules. Um, it allows them to build their own uh, set of skills and grow their resource bank of their own accord. Um, so I just wanna emphasize that all of our partners are discussing the importance of this, but um, I don't, none of them have really come forward with um, a program that's been longstanding and effective. So while in Houston, we are aware of how important that is, um, I couldn't point to uh, a program that the resettlement agencies have developed um, that is truly effective. Um, so we're still, we're aware of it, but we're lacking in that regard. And agree with Lulu too. Um, it's just not something that, <laughs> we are equipped with to fully answer. I mean, even just technology in general, being able to access or have access to technology that they can use. I mean, even let's say internet access, um, that's again, all of these are something that is not easily accessible by some of our um, community members. John Nori, and thank you, Lulu. Uh, we, uh, one more question um, and uh, any of either, any of you can answer this. How are your health centers uh, addressing patient screening processes being culturally and linguistically conscious? So there's various screening processes in a health center and also, I mean, with COVID-19 vaccines and other things though, how are you um, addressing that to be culturally and culturally accessible? So I would like to talk about um, recent health screenings that we've done for the incoming Afghani community. Um, they're very simple screenings, but um, when women are asked about their health, we, it's, they're obviously very uncomfortable if the interpreter or community health worker that is working with them is a man. So we try and make sure that uh, gender aligns according to culture um, to make them as comfortable and forthcoming as possible about their health behaviors. Um, so that's recently what uh, we've made sure to prioritize to be culturally sensitive to this incoming population of patients. The same was true even when we were seeing Syrian refugees come to Houston, the preference to have uh, physicians, nurses, and interpreters who um, are of the same gender was important, like I said, um, not only to make the patient feel comfortable, but to get accurate patient histories and then develop the most effective treatment plans. Thank you, Lulu. All right, uh, I'm looking at the time, it's 11.53. Uh, and again, as I uh, as we've been sharing, there's just a lot more content and a lot more insights, a lot more questions to ask um, uh, and gain uh, insights from everyone that's here in, the, in this webinar, but we have a limited time here. Um, so I do want to move forward uh, with some resources. Um, here are some extensive in-language resources we encourage you to peruse and utilize in your health center from the National Resource Center for Refugees, Immigrants, and Migrants Translated Materials Library. 
Um, the link will be in the chat and also protecting immigrants families, um, immigrant families coalition video series that's also going to be dropped in the chat. Um, and they have uh, numerous translated materials and also uh, the NRC RIM, um, the National Research Center for Refugees, Immigrants and Migrants. Uh, they also have templates for you to use if um, their resources are not uh, translated in the languages that your patients and community speak. And also uh, just um, in terms of timeliness, uh, we are also hosting a, a booster shot uh, webinar next Tuesday, uh, and we encourage you to go to there since um, we were chatting earlier before the webinar started, and there's lots of confusion. So we hope to answer some of those, um, those questions. Um, and as a reminder, we'll share the recording link, slides, resources, panelists, contact information. Um, we're going to gather some questions, and if some of the panelists have time to answer some of those questions, um, they, they will answer some of those on a document as well. So thank you to, for um, additional work for that. Uh, let's next slide. Um, thank you to you, everyone. Thank you all. Uh, we appreciate all of the the feedback. Um, also uh, recognize the um, um, the struggles that we um, had with some facilitating some of our activities. So we recognize. Um, the um, unintentional, but the impact um, impact of um, what we did. So uh, we appreciate your feedback on that. An evaluation will pop up after the end of this uh, webinar when we, we um, close it out. So feel free to share your thoughts there. Um, it'll be about a three to five minute evaluation. For those of you who do not have time today, the link will be emailed with the recording, slides, panelists, contact information, and resources as well. And again, Thank you all for attending today. Thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing about your work. Uh, and of course, Farm Worker Justice uh, for your partnership on this. Um, thank you so much and take good care, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Okay, let's.